There's a solitary, humble, wooden structure on a windswept hill in rural New England. To open the door is to engage our minds, our hearts, and our imaginations. In this place, preachers and professors, past and present, come alive as they walk the aisle, ascend the pulpit stairs, and teach. From theology, from history, and from the Word of God, welcome to the Saybrook Meeting House, an audio production of Saybrook Ministries. Now I would like to call your attention this morning to uh, what we have already read together in the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke from verse 46 to verse 55 which we refer to uh, familiarly as the Magnificat because of the words which Mary uttered at the very beginning of uh, her expression of thanksgiving and of praise. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and so on until we come to the end in verse 55. Now, this uh, statement, this bursting forth of Mary into worship and praise and adoration, which, as I say, we call the Magnificat, is something which is worthy of our most careful consideration. There is perhaps no better way of approaching this whole season of the year and the coming of Christmas than uh, to do so in terms of a consideration of this particular message. Indeed, I think we can uh, say that there is no better test of our understanding of the meaning of the Incarnation, everything we think of and celebrate during these years, then our reaction to this song of Mary's. Because, as I want to try to show you, here in this short compass, in a very extraordinary manner, she brings us face to face with some of the very central matters in connection with our salvation. Now, there are many things which are of great interest, with which we cannot stay this morning. I merely note them in passing. It's very interesting, for instance, uh, to notice the stages through which Mary herself passed in connection with this momentous event which was uh, to take place. You noticed how when, first of all, the archangel Gabriel went to her and made his announcement, Mary was incredulous. She was skeptical. She stumbled. The thing, of course, was so staggering, so unusual, so amazing, that she couldn't receive it. And uh, she makes her protestation. Indeed, she virtually suggests to the angel that what he is saying is quite impossible. But the angel reminds her that with God nothing shall be impossible. That she mustn't think in those terms and in those categories that she must realize here that she is in a different realm, that he is no ordinary human emissary, nor the bearer of a message from any uh, earthly or human power, but that he is the messenger of God. And then we notice that as the result of that, Mary goes to this second stage in which she says, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. A most interesting process, this. So typical and characteristic of the way in which the gospel tends to come to all of us. At first it seems impossible. But then we feel rebuked for that and we say, well, I don't understand it, but I'll submit. That's what Mary did. She still doesn't understand. All right, she seems to say, I hear what you've said to me and I... Know that what you say is right concerning God, that with God nothing is impossible. I therefore leave myself in God's hands. Still not understanding, but ready to wait and to listen and to follow. A most important step. 
But then, you remember, she went and visited her cousin Elizabeth. And as the result of what happened to Elizabeth, and especially as the result of what Elizabeth said to her, Mary bursts forth into this great song, this great hymn of praise. Mary, uh, Elizabeth turned to Mary and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which are told her, were told her from the Lord. And that seems to have been the thing used by the Holy Spirit to bring Mary to her real understanding, because the moment Elizabeth said that to her, we read, and Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Well now, then, it is thus we see that uh, God used the very words of Elizabeth to confirm to Mary the announcement that had already been made by the archangel. And as the result of this, she pours forth her heart in this extraordinary praise and adoration to God. And it's to that that I want to call your attention. Now let us look at some of the characteristics of uh, these words uttered by Mary. First, let us obviously notice the depth of feeling, the depth of feeling with which she spoke, which is conveyed, of course, in these words. She says, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Now, she chooses to refer to her soul and her spirit. This is a very interesting point, a very interesting theological point. She draws a distinction between her soul and her spirit. Again, we mustn't stay with this this morning, and we mustn't build too much upon it. But at any rate, I think we are reminded here as elsewhere in Scripture that whether the soul and spirit are essentially one or not, there is a distinction between them. The soul in general passes for the rational powers. When the expression soul is used in this way in contradistinction to spirit, it is meant to refer to the intellect and to the feelings, the way in which we correspond with one another and have fellowship and relationship with one another. The soul is essentially the rational part of men. What is the spirit then? Well, the spirit rather represents the perception. There is a difference between ability and understanding. There is a, a difference between knowledge and perception. The spirit is a higher faculty, a higher aspect of this uh, possession uh, which we all have. It includes the capacity for worship. The soul, in other words, is that which links us to all that is round and about us, to men and to animals, to history and to the world and all we can see. That's the soul, but the spirit is that part, if you like, even of the soul, if you want to argue that... Uh, there are only two parts in men and not three parts. Uh, nevertheless, you must say that there is this compartment, as it were, of the soul, which enables one to appreciate the unseen and the spiritual, the higher, everything that is greatest and uppermost in men. Well, now then, Mary uses the two expressions, my soul and my spirit, by which he means this that she is moved in the very depth and center of her being. She is not merely pleased in a general sense and on the surface. It's not merely something of general interest to her. She has got a realization of something that she says has touched her in the very center and the most vital part of her personality. Now, this is why all this is so important. That is the effect, you see, of the good news of salvation upon the soul. 
This is the effect to which it has always led when people have rarely understood what it's all about. In other words, we come back to a theme we were dealing with recently in the fifth chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians. There is all the difference between mere singing and making melody in our hearts. The heart, you see, includes, as it were, this same thing, the soul and spirit, the very center of men's whole personality. And it is there that this response to the gospel really comes forth. That's where it emanates. That's where it has its origin. And thus we find Mary, obviously, stirred to the very depths of her soul. And the result is that she speaks with a, a sense of dignity and uh, of greatness. As she is uh, aware of something profound, and you can't read through what she said without sensing her sense of awe and of wonder, of worship and of amazement. My soul, my spirit. This, she seems to be saying, is the most amazing thing I've ever known. I am beyond and beside myself, my soul and my spirit. Very well. There, then, I say, is the first thing that emerges and the first thing, therefore, by which we test ourselves. You but to read the New Testament to see that all men who truly have understood the gospel have said something similar. You read uh, even the psalmist looking forward to it. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I could quote hymns to you. I could quote statements to you of the saints uh, throughout uh, the centuries. They're, they're all saying the same thing. And of course it must be true. If we do really understand what happened when the Son of God left the courts of heaven and came into this world in this way and manner, if we do grasp something of its eternal significance, of its profundity, its amazing character, how can it fail to move us, especially in our souls and in our spirits? That's the test. And here, you see, we are again reminded of how this season can be so abused even in the church. While men talk about themselves and one another and about a Christmas spirit. No, no. This is the dimension. This is it. It's not just a good feel feeling of goodwill and of friendliness and of happiness. It is something, if we really get hold of it, that moves us in the soul and in the spirit. Well, let me go to a second point. There is the depth of the feeling, but look for a moment at the manifestation of this feeling. And two words come out. The first is the element of adoration. My soul doth magnify the Lord. Now, this is an extraordinary expression. It means to make great and to make glorious. But, says someone, what a foolish term. How can one magnify God? How can a human being, a creature, one who is but a creator, created being, how can one magnify, make great, multiply as it were, the Lord God Almighty. Well, of course, in an ultimate sense, it can't be done. And Mary realized that, as all the psalmists who use the term realized it. And yet there is a sense in which it's very true. Because while we cannot do anything as such to God in his greatness and in his majesty, we can help other people to see it. We can, as it were, act as a kind of lens that makes him greater in the eyes and in the estimate and in the sight of people. And that is what Mary was trying to express. It is as if she was saying, how can I make known what I have seen of the greatness and of the glory of God? That's what she's expressing. I, I want everybody to know this. I want everybody to see it. My soul doth magnify the law. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm clutching at every expression that I can get hold of in order to express something of his greatness and something of his glory. That's what she's expressing. It is then, I say, a very profound way of uh, giving expression to this depth of desire 
that God might be known and might be seen, that what he is might be brought in a large way and painted on an enormous canvas that the whole world may see it and look at it and bow before him in adoration and in praise. My soul doth magnify the Lord. Well, here we are again. I'm simply taking these words this morning and holding them before you in order that we may examine ourselves in the light of them. Do our souls magnify the Lord? Is this our innermost desire? The psalmist has expressed it, you know. The psalmist has said, Oh, come, he says, and magnify the Lord with me. Let's do it together, he says. Let everybody join in. Let us make his name great. Let us hold it before the nations and the peoples. The other expression is rejoice. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Now, the word rejoice isn't quite good enough. It isn't quite strong enough. The word really means to exalt him. If you like, it means to make your boast in. This is the thing in which I exult. The world is always exulting in various things. Men exult in themselves. They make their proud boast of themselves. They praise themselves. Oh, says Mary, my spirit exalts in God. Here is the theme of my rejoicing. In God, my Savior. Well, let's go on to the next step to see the full significance of this. What is the cause of this feeling within her? And here we come to what I want to emphasize particularly this morning. Why is Mary magnifying the Lord? Why does her spirit exult in God her Savior? And she really supplies us with the answer. It is not primarily because of what had happened to her. She does mention that it comes in. But that's a mere incident in her hymn of praise. What is the cause of her exaltation and of her adoration, of her praise? Well, it is because God himself is who and what he is. And because of what he is doing with respect to the world. Mary's eye, in other words, is not upon herself. You see how certain parts of the church have so abused and made an utter travesty of this. Mary is full of humility. She refers to herself as what she was, the low estate of thine handmaiden. There's nothing here about the mother of God and about the queen of heaven. Mary isn't thinking about herself. Mary has seen something that makes her forget herself. And this is the ultimate test of a true understanding of what happened when God, in the fullness of the times, sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Mary is rejoicing, not in the fact so much that she's to be given this great privilege. She's been reminded by Elizabeth of what it is and that people are going to call her blessed. And she repeats that, that all generations from henceforth shall call me blessed, but that isn't the thing that really moves her. What is the thing that makes her magnify the Lord and her spirit to exalt in God her Savior? Well, it is, I say, what God is doing, this historic event, this climactic action of God himself. She is humbled and grateful at the thought of the fact that she is to be given a part and a place in this, but it's the thing itself that moves her and makes her sing and worship. She's filled with a sense of amazement, of worship, adoration, and utter astonishment. Why? Well, she sees the inner meaning of the action. She's got a glimpse and a glimmering of understanding of the whole purpose of salvation, of what God is doing in bringing forth this son of his in the world, even out of her womb. Now that's, you see, the whole secret of this song. As I say also, it is the whole secret of the whole Christian position. What is it, in other words, that leads to worship and to praise, to exaltation, to adoration? And the answer is, it is always understanding. 
You see, the only singing that's of any value in the sight of God is that which is based upon the understanding, the understanding of the truth. That is why we must take this occasion to remind ourselves, therefore, that we must never go for the emotions directly. We must never go for the will directly. The emotions and the will are the result of something seen by the understanding. That is what Elizabeth shows. She was filled with the Holy Ghost, we are told, and she spoke forth with understanding, enlightenment of the Spirit. And exactly the same thing is true here of Mary. And what Mary sees is not that she is to be made great because she has this privilege, but the greatness of the God who is acting and the greatness of the action which he is taking. So let us follow her. In the expression of her feeling, that's my fourth point, the expression of her feeling, what does she say? Well, the main thing here, of course, is that Mary is telling us certain things about God as he is. She is adoring God for being what he is. And this is the very essence of Christian worship and of Christian praise. Alas, in our weakness and frailty, we are so concerned with benefits that we forget the giver. But here is adoration and worship at its very best. Now, there are two dangers confronting us. There's the danger to which I've already referred, the monstrosity of the false teaching and the exaggeration of the Roman Catholic Church. But let us be careful also that in a violent reaction against that, we do not underestimate what Mary saw and what she expressed in the Magnificat. Let us keep to the balance of the scripture and not be governed by prejudices. And here she is, you see, expressing the very heart and soul and center of Christian praise and worship and adoration. God himself, what? Well, first and foremost, his greatness and his glory. My soul doth magnify the Lord. There's nothing above that. We'll never rise above that. To magnify the Lord. The Lord is Jehovah. And he is to be magnified and praised and worshipped because of that. Who is he? He says, I am that I am. There is the element in it. Also, uh, I am what I shall become, but the great central thing is this, that he is from eternity to eternity. I am that I am, the Lord. Great is the Lord, says the psalmist, and greatly to be praised. You see, my dear friends, we haven't understood the meaning of Christmas. Unless we come there, we don't stop in the stable and with the manger. Of course, we must go there. But you see, what we see there is this great God, the Lord. And the moment you do that, you get your right perspective. You get your right way of looking at things. Haven't we reached a terrible pass when it is essential to remind Christian people that they must not allow their thinking to be governed by the world at a time like this, but by the scripture and its teaching. And this is the scriptural way. You start with this Lord. You magnify the Lord. Why? Well, he is responsible for everything that has happened. It is his action. He is the one who is ultimately to be praised. Well, then take the second term, Savior. My soul, she says, doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God. My Savior. What does the term Savior mean? Well, it's a great term used by, by the Bible everywhere concerning God. It's the one who delivers. It's the one who keeps. This is a wonderful summary of Old Testament history that we have in this Magnificat. You see, what Mary is saying is this, Oh God, my soul doth magnify thee. Why? Well, I can see now that you are doing what you've always done. You are always the same. You've been doing it throughout the centuries. But now here's the climax. And it is the climax of all that had gone before. The Savior. That was God's character with respect to Israel, wasn't it? 
Read your Old Testament. What is it? It's a history of God ever delivering these people. Look how he delivered them out of the captivity and the bondage of Egypt. They'd have perished there. It would have been the end. Well, how did they ever come out? How did they ever go to the land of Canaan, the land of possession? It was God, the Savior, who brought them out with his strong arm. The Savior, of course. And so he continued to be. How often did he deliver them from their cruel enemies? How often did he vanquish mighty armies when they were comparatively defenseless? Read the historical books and you'll see God the Savior. Mary sees all this. And then go on and see how even from the captivity of Babylon he brought back a remnant to carry on his purpose. It is always God the Savior. And thus the psalmist says very rightly, He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Even when they were rebellious and sinful, he kept his eye upon them. He allows things to go so far, but never further. He allows enemies to arise and conquer them, but never to destroy them. He is the savior of his people. He is the shepherd of the flock. My savior. Mary sees it. And now she suddenly sees that God is doing this on an infinitely bigger scale. God, my Savior, what is this action? What is he doing to me, she seems to say. Ah, this is a part of his salvation for the world. God, my Savior. And then she comes and pays a special attention to his power. She is very impressed by this. Listen to her. He that is mighty, in verse 49, he that is mighty hath done to me great things. And again in verse 51. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He that is mighty. Oh, it's not surprising that she emphasizes this. It is this, if I may so put it, that enables God to be the Savior. If this were not true of God, he couldn't be the Savior. And this is the thing that is especially needed by the world, this thing that is especially needed by all of us. Why does he magnify God for his greatness, for his power, and for his strength? Well, she contrasts it with her own weakness and with the utter weakness and helplessness and hopelessness of the world. The hope for the world this morning is the power of God, the strength of his arm. He that is mighty. He is almighty. The angel had fortunately reminded her of that. She'd stumbled, she said. How can this be, seeing that I know not a man? You are telling me that I'm to bring forth a son, but I'm a virgin. I've never known a man. How can this be? The thing is impossible. And the answer is, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Thank God. He has the essence of salvation. It is the might and strength of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, says Paul. Why? It is the power of God and to salvation to everyone that believeth. The power. And Mary's soul magnifies the Lord because of this. And so should ours. Look at it like this. The world is as it is because it is in the grip and under the power of the devil and of hell. The devil is the god of this world. He is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And his power is a mighty power. You go back and read your Old Testament. Look at him as he tempts the greatest patriarch and saint. They fall before him in utter weakness and helplessness. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Is there any hope for the world this morning? Does it lie in conferences in Paris or somewhere else? Does it lie in the future? No, it doesn't. The world goes round and round in circles. It lacks the power to deal with the situation. But thank God we are reminded this morning of one that is mighty. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He is the almighty one. He is God. 
Now that's the first and primary name that is used with respect to God in the Bible. It is the word El, and it means the strong one. When God was revealing himself to the people, that's the name he used. I am the strong one, the Almighty. And so, you see, the archangel Gabriel is reminding Mary of something that is crucial and vital in this whole situation. There would be no salvation for this world were it not that God is the Mighty One, the Almighty. And what he's doing there in Bethlehem is manifesting his power, the power of God unto salvation. An extraordinary thing, a still more extraordinary way of doing it, but that is what he's doing. God is putting into motion his plan. It is working out according to his power. Then we hurry to the next point which he makes, and that is his holiness. Did you notice this? He that is mighty hath done to me great things, and then, and holy is his name. I wonder whether you've ever stopped at that and asked the question, why does she say that there? Why does she bring that in at all? And uh, you notice especially that she connects it with the power by means of the word and. I magnify the Lord, she says, not only for his power, but also for his holiness. Why the holiness? Well, this again is one of the keys to the understanding of the whole purpose of salvation. Why is there a salvation? Why did God ever send his only son into this world? Why was there ever a cross on Calvary's hill? And you know, in the last analysis, this is the answer. Because God is holy. Because his name is holy. What does it mean? Well, the Bible puts it in many ways. God is light, it says, and in him is no darkness at all. He's a burning fire. That's an expression of God's holiness. What has it got to do with salvation, says someone? Well, it has this to do with it. God is not only the eternal opposite to sin. God is eternally opposed to sin. God hates sin. And it is because God hates sin that there is a salvation. Look at it like this. God made the world, made it perfect. There was nothing wrong. There was no blemish. He looked at it and saw that it was good. Ah, but sin came in. The devil introduced evil. Sin has become rampant. Evil is widespread. And God in his holiness cannot tolerate it. It is because God hates sin with all the intensity of his holy nature that there is a salvation. I do not hesitate to make a statement like this. I say that it is because his name is holy that he must deal with sin. That he must bring in redemption. God being God cannot leave the world as it is. In sin, under the power of the devil, ruled by the God of this world. No, no, that's utterly opposed to him and he hates it. And he will get rid of it. His name is holy. And because it is, he has done what he has done. And everything God does is holy. It isn't merely powerful, it is holy. Did you notice, indeed, how the archangel Gabriel put it uh, to Mary herself? He said, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And then did you notice that amazing expression, that holy thing that shall be born of thee. Everything about this salvation is holy. Jesus Christ was perfect. There was no sin in him. He didn't inherit Adam's nature, the sin that was in Adam's nature. He was pure. He was holy. That holy thing that shall be born of thee. And right through the whole of his teaching and in everything that he did, this element of holiness always comes out. There he is born as a babe, yes, but he's not an ordinary babe. He is separate from sin, separate from sinners. No sin in him, holy. Jump right to the cross. What's happening there? Ah, it's the same element of holiness that I see. It is God's hatred of sin, God punishing sin, God getting rid of sin. 
Holy is his name. Everything in connection with this great movement of salvation from beginning to end is characterized by holiness. But there's one other term. Listen to it. It is this wonderful term, mercy. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Once more, I ask you to notice the word and at the beginning of that 50th verse. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Thank God for this end. Why? Well, for this good reason. If God were only almighty and holy, there would be no hope for us at all. If it were only true to say of God that he is the mighty one, the almighty one, that he is holy and of such a pure countenance that he cannot even look upon sin, we would not be meeting together like this this morning. We would not be singing these hymns of praise in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Well, because if God were only almighty and holy, we should all be blotted out. The whole world would be destroyed. There would be no salvation. But thank God for this little end. And his mercy, great in power, glorious in holiness and in majesty. But thank God, full of mercy and full of compassion. This is the thing that saves us. What does mercy mean? Well, perhaps the best way to answer that question is to consider it in the light of the word grace. Grace and mercy go together, and grace comes before mercy. What is grace? Well, grace is love and favor uh, toward those who do not deserve it because of their guilt. Grace is kindness and goodness revealed to those who don't deserve it because they are guilty. That's what grace means. What is mercy? Well, mercy means love toward those who are not merely guilty, but who are miserable in their guilt. And who are miserable because they are guilty. That's the difference between grace and mercy. Grace is more general. Mercy is particular. His mercy, which means this, that God looks down and sees mankind in its misery, in its agony, in its pain. Now, of course, as I've already reminded you, Mary is summarizing the whole history of the Old Testament. Do you remember what God said to Moses when he called him to deliver the children of Israel? This is how he put it. I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. If that doesn't melt us and break us, what can? That's mercy. This great self-existent God who is from eternity to eternity everlasting in his holiness and in his glory, the God who could exist apart from men and who doesn't need men. He created men and men in his folly fell into sin and there he is in his misery and unhappiness and wretchedness and this august eternal God says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. I've looked upon it. I've seen it. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskers. For I know their sorrows. That's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That's why he came so willingly. That is why he laid aside the signs of his glory and humbled himself and made himself of no reputation. God had seen our misery, not only our guilt, but our misery, our unhappiness, our unwretchedness, the state of the world as the result of sin. As John Milton puts it in his hymn, he hath with a piteous eye looked upon our misery, for his mercies, ay, endure, ever faithful, Ever sure, Mary praises God 
for his mercy, his compassion, for his piteous eye. And then I merely mention it, I'm not going to stay with it, his faithfulness. He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abram and to his seed forever. God never forgets his promise. God had promised that he would visit and redeem his people. And Mary sees of a sudden that what is happening to her is a part of this fulfillment of the promises of God. All the Old Testament prophets had been waiting and longing and crying out as it were, O come, O come, Emmanuel, when will he come? God's promised him. When will he appear? She realizes that at last he is about to appear. That the holy thing that is to be born out of her womb is God's yea and amen to all the promises that he had made beginning in the Garden of Eden itself and continuing through prophets and seers and sages and kings and psalmists, even unto this very hour, God hath visited and hath redeemed his people. For his mercies, a and b, are ever faithful, ever sure. That's why Mary speaks as she does. That's why she says, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, the Almighty, the Holy One, the One who hath mercy and compassion, who for his great love wherewith he loved us hath sent his only Son not only into the world but even to the death of the cross. Great in might, great in mercy. Oh, the riches of his grace, the unsearchable riches of his grace toward us in his Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Have you seen it? Mary saw it in a flash. She'd stumbled, she couldn't. At last she sees it. The movement of God in salvation, and that's the response. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Saviour. Has it come to you like that? Well, meditate upon it. Meditate upon it in terms of Scripture. See that it ever leads you to God, who in his glory, in his majesty, has looked upon us and the world with such a piteous eye as to send his only Son into it for our redemption. Thank you for joining us this week at the Saybrook Meeting House. We hope you've been blessed by today's podcast. Saybrook Ministries' mission is to provide didactic and devotional content from the Christian faith delivered to the saints, recovered and refined by the Protestant Reformation. Be sure to visit saybrookministries.org for continually updated Christian content designed to inspire and invigorate our imagination and intellect. Join us next week for another journey to the Saybrook Meeting House. Until then, may God bless you.